second symposium uh, led by Fred Siegel, our visiting professor of economics, history, and political science here at St. Francis, and moderated by Dr. Frank Macarola, our former president and the former chancellor of the New York City Schools, and currently the chancellor here at St. Francis. Uh, Dr. Macchiarola earned his bachelor's degree here at St. Francis and his law degree and PhD in public law and government at Columbia University. His career has included service in the city's public and private universities. He served as dean of Benjamin Cardoza Law School at Yeshiva University, as professor and assistant vice president at Columbia, as professor and assistant vice president at Baruch College, and as vice president at the Graduate School and University Center of the City University of New York. Please welcome Frank Macchiarola. Thank you, Dr. Houlihan, and I want to thank uh, the President, uh, Brenda Dugan, for allowing us to do this. Uh, one of the nice things about, about President Dugan is that he lets me get out of control. <laughs> so I'm able to do things with good people that I want to do, and he supports it thoroughly, and I'm very grateful to you, Brenda, for that. Uh, a panel like this, uh, when you see these four people, you should realize that there is a test. Who gets to be on the panel? I have to do two things with these people. Number one, I have to like them, and I have to respect them. So if you see a panel at St. Francis College that I'm involved in, you know that the panelists will be liked and will be respected. And that's the case with each of our panelists and our moderator. So let me, uh, before I introduce the, the moderator, the um, introduce Fred, um, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about each of them that are not, they're in the program, you've got a program, you don't want to hear me. Uh, but I want to tell you a little about why we they hear us. Um, Tom Swazi, Nassau County Executive, former candidate for governor. And I know there are a lot of people in this room that voted for him. Uh, some of them are actually up here. Uh, he is known as a politician. <laughs> well, he read, you know, I mean, Swazi, what do you think this is? Uh, <laughs> so on, you can figure it out. Um, a politician who's regularly ahead of the curve in 2004, long before the abject dysfunction of Albany. He w was widely recognized. Tom Swazi speaking on behalf of his organization, FixAlbany.com, said, quote, up to now, New York residents haven't connected the dots that laws passed in Albany mean higher property taxes for us at home. The era of closed door, insiders only state government in Albany that has existed for generations must end. And hopefully, that will happen someday. In 2008, Tom chaired the New York State Commission on Property Tax Relief. Its recommendations have yet to be enacted upon, as I said, ahead of the curve. Second on the panel is a senior fellow for tax and budget studies at the Manhattan Institute, which is co-sponsoring this event with us. We are very grateful to the Manhattan Institute for all of the good things that they do, the forums that they run, the opportunities that they give for people to both in the City Journal and in their various forums say important things about what should be done. <clears throat> EJ says important things all the time. And he is credible, he is honest, and he is the go-to guy when people want to know what the story is. And usually, uh, when journalists are figuring out what's going on, they go to EJ, because he's got the budget, he knows what's happening, and he is able to help them. Third member of the panel, everybody knows him as a distinguished professor at SUNY New Paul's. We know his work, his splendid studies on the governorship, uh, his public service in the legislature of Orange County. Uh, they know all that stuff. Uh, but what they don't know is, that I stole all of his notes when I was in graduate school. <laughs> Every good idea I ever had 
uh, first came to me from Jerry Benjamin, uh, someone that I admire and respect, a great scholar uh, and a wonderful friend. And so, Jerry, we welcome you. To our uh, chief, the distinguished professor here at uh, St. Francis College, our visiting professor, and someone who has really done wonderful things both for the college in terms of our programs, in terms of the recognition, in terms of our students, in terms of the forum that he has from time to time. His teaching he is a splendid addition to the college, and we're very grateful for Fred and the work that he does. So, um, Fred, are you going to say something? Okay, Fred's going to tell you the truth. <laughs> the truth. Thank you, Frank. Um, this is going to be very brief. I just, for those who don't, uh, don't spend your time being depressed by reading about the state budget or the dysfunction at all, and just made a few notes, just a, a kind of overview of the dysfunction. Unfortunately, these are not the ones. Essentially, we have a dual dilemma. Uh, on one hand, our state institutions are breaking down. On the other hand, the economic assumptions we've operated under for the past 25 years are also breaking down. So we've got a problem. And if you think of this just on the governmental level, we have a governor who resigned, a controller who resigned, the former president of the state senate under indictment, and then extraordinary shenanigans this past summer in the state senate, which is more amusing than edifying. At the same time, in the midst of the Great Recession, New York's accidental governor, David Patterson, took office. On March 17, 2008, you'll recognize that day, that's the day that Bear Stearns collapsed. He was dealt a very tough hand. Now, here's what David Patterson inherited, the state still has to contend with. New York's pension costs are the highest in the nation. We spend more than any other state on pension costs essentially roughly $500 for every man, woman, and child in the state. We have in New York eight of the 10 counties with the highest real estate taxes as a percentage of home value in the entire United States. And if you look at, at just raw numbers, New York and New Jersey are pick slots one through 10 now for the highest property taxes in America. Our Medicaid program spends 45 billion a year that's not just more than any other state, that's more than California and Texas combined. Together they have three times our population. And yet, our Medicaid spending has not produced a noticeable improvement in the health of our population. It's quite average, and in some areas, below average. In the midst of this recession, in the midst of this dysfunction, we have a state budget this year which spends at seven times the rate of inflation. Astounding. As far as I know, we're the only state, I, I'm almost sure that we're the only state that says anything remotely like this increase. Essentially, people in Albany live in a parallel universe. In the words of our governor, none of this makes sense. Governor Patterson recently noted that despite tax increases, treating people who make more than $200,000 a year as if they were millionaires, revenue projections continue to fall. Here's the governor. You've heard the mantra, mantra, tax the rich, tax the rich. Well, we've done that, and we've probably lost jobs and driven people out of the state. Essentially, New York is staring down the barrel of a $38 billion budget gap, cumulative budget gap, over the next uh, three years. The problem is not revenues, the problem is spending, out of control spending. That's the hole we're in, and that's why we assemble these gentlemen to tell us how to dig, dig ourselves out of the hole. With that, let me bring up Tom Swazi. Well, thank you, Fred. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm very uh, happy to be here. I'm a little intimidated by this impressive panel with the great ability and talent that exists here, and I'm. I hope I can live up to their standards that they've asked me to come and speak here tonight. Uh, Frank mentioned that I ran for governor of New York State. It is true. I was in a Democratic primary against Elliot Spitzer. 
Did not turn out very well for me. Didn't turn out very well for Elliot either. But <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate the very kind introduction that I received. I, uh, I'll get, you know, we know all the problems that exist. Fred just talked about the spending, not only the pensions, Medicaid two and a half times the cost of the national average. We spend more per student than any state in the United States of America, but our results are as low as number 30 in some of the standardized testing that exists throughout, throughout the country. So no matter what item you look at in our budget, you see that we're spending these enormous amounts of money and not getting the results. It'd be great if we were spending the money and we were like the number one in the country as far as our performance in healthcare. It'd be great, we'd be living up to a, the social contract that we have had in New York State for a long time. We, if we had great results in our education system, it would be wonderful. It'd be, be a good debate whether it was worth spending the money to that degree if we had the results. But we're spending the money and we're not getting the results in any of these areas. And as we know, people are leaving the state in droves, droves especially upstate New York. We have a lot of immigration coming into the city of New York. When I live in Nassau County, we have very little growth taking place because we're suburban sprawl is a very big part of that as well. But it's also because we have these very high property taxes. And property taxes is what brought me into this issue of what's wrong with Albany. Because I came into Nassau County as rated the worst run county in the United States of America before I got there. And I had to reduce the workforce. I cut the workforce to the smallest in 30 years. There's a thousand less people working for Nassau County. And the day I took office, 10% lower than the day I took office. I had to renegotiate the labor contracts. I had to cut the borrowing. I had to consolidate departments. All these things I was doing, I still saw certain costs escalating at enormous rates of 10% a year. Medicaid was the big one. And that's what got me into Fix Albany because county executives and the city of New York had been complaining for years that Albany was pushing these costs down to us at the local level and not doing anything about it. And we started Fix Albany with the idea that we were going to defeat incumbents, Democrats in the Assembly, Republicans in the State Senate at the time, to get them to pay attention to what we were doing. After I engaged in that campaign, it was only I, I did it by myself, nobody else really signed up to do it other than me. We did defeat one assembly, in the, uh, assembly member, Democrat in the primary, and defeated a Republican in the State Senate, helped defeat a de Republican in the State Senate. And I soon thereafter became the chairman of the New York State County Executives Association, and people were listening a little bit more. And we got them to cap the growth of Medicaid uh, at the local level. And cap in the growth of Medicaid at the local level forced the expenses up to the state. The growth of the program would have to be picked up by the folks that were giving us the growth in the program, which was the state of New York. And it's one of the things that forced then Governor Pataki, then Governor Spitzer, and now David Patterson, that they realize they have to address the Medicaid problem because the problem is not going to be picked up by the local governments. It's actually saved a billion dollars throughout the entire state over the past couple of years. New York City probably benefited the most. I know that my county benefited, other counties benefit as well, but it's forced the responsibility onto the state. So the problems that exist in our state, I believe, are based on simple issues of accountability. So there's two basic problems. One problem is related to the issue of mandates, state laws. Now why does the state keep on passing law after law after law after law after law after law after law that has negative consequences for many constituencies, local governments being a big part of it, but thereby the people. Uh, why do they keep on passing these laws that have given us the highest local taxes in America. 78% above the national average. I hate to say Fred Siegel's wrong, but Fred Siegel's wrong. It's not eight out of 10, it's nine out of 10 counties in New York State have the highest local taxes, highest property taxes in America as a percentage of home value. Four of the top 10 counties in America with the highest property taxes as a percentage of income are in downstate New York. Uh, four of the top 10 counties in the United States of America have the highest property taxes as a dollar amount are in downstate New York. We have the highest local taxes in America. The city of New York is property taxes, which we've seen go up quite a bit over the past few years, but also income taxes and sales taxes as well. Highest local taxes in America, 78% above the national average. So how do we get all these mandates? Why did this happen that so many laws have been passed that we need to pay for them all? Is it because these, everybody in Albany is horrible and they don't care and they're just rotten and they're no good? Why do they just keep on passing law after law after law after law after law? Well, I use... I use the example of my capital budget in the county of Nassau. Every year I've got to say, we're going to spend this much money in our capital budget, $100 million. And what should we spend the money on? So I ask my department heads, what should we spend our $100 million on capital budget that you're, you, know, you borrow money to 
to pay for long-term projects. And they say, well, you know, we need to fix this building over here, or we need to buy this piece of property, or we need to buy this equipment, or we need to uh, pave these roads, or we need to do this other long-term capital project because this issue will either save us money, this one will make the quality of life better, this is a health and safety issue, this is what we should invest $100 million in. So then I'll ask my legislators, these 19 legislators, what would you like us to spend the $100 million on? And they'll say, well, in my district, this would be very important. The people are very concerned about this particular issue, and I'd like to see this happen, and this will make people's lives better, and this would be great, and you should spend the money on that. And then I'll look through the mail from the constituents. You know, we got a petition on this issue, or it's something that a lot of people have been writing letters about a particular thing, or some important issue. And we can look at all the requests that have been made as to how we should spend our capital dollars. We have a $100 million budget. And it's not $100 million in requests, it's $500 million in requests. So we can't do all $500 million worth of projects. So we have to prioritize and do what we think is most important that fits within our budget. Because we can only borrow a certain amount of money because you have to pay the money back and you have to pay back the debt service year after year after year. What happens though is that Project 499 has a group that's in favor of it. And they love Project 499. And they go to a local legislator and they say, you know, Project 499 is the best project in the world, and this project will save people's lives, and this will make people's lives better, and this will be do this and it'll do that. And the legislators listen and say, you know what? I like Project 499. That sounds like a great project. And they'll go out and make a speech. Go, let, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Project 499 is the best project that ever happened. And if we do Project 499, people's lives will be better, and we will save the environment, small children will be smiling. We must do Project 499. The problem, and the people are clapping, they love it, Project 49. See, they have this, this constituency that's all in favor of Project 49. The problem is, is that Project 499 would never have been done in the context of the $100 million worth of pro projects. It's a good idea, but you can't afford to do every single good idea. But because our legislators have been influenced and they see this project as being all well intentioned, they want to try and do all these good, different things. So that's why we've seen this series of laws. So it's not, I don't think, I don't think there's evil intent, but there's an objective that they want to try and do all these things to satisfy these different constituencies over a long period of time, one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. They've given us these high costs, high taxes, made our state very non-competitive. So the second reason, the mandates, the first, the second reason is, well, why don't they say that they're hurting us? Why don't they understand that they have to do something about this because we have the highest local taxes in America. People are suffering from the property taxes they pay where, where we live, and in Westchester County, and in Putnam, and Rockland, and there's problems with the MTA, and there's problems with people leaving upstate New York in droves, and there's problems all over the place. Why don't they see that they have to fix those problems? Why is it that they're concerned that their actions or inaction will get them voted out of office? Why aren't they concerned that, that will happen, that they're gonna lose their race? How can it be that the state Senate could have acted, acted over this past summer with such craven self-interest that they would not expect that the public was gonna vote them out of office because they're not going to. They're not gonna vote them out of office. There's a 99% re-election rate. There have been more people indicted in the state Senate and the state assembly over the past five years than have lost their jobs at the polling booth. So they're not gonna lose their office because most people, you know, you're. You're an odd group, I gotta tell you. You're out here at night listening to a, 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 a panel discussion about reforming New York State government. Can it be reformed? This, you're not normal. <laughs> Most people are not paying, they don't know who their state senator is or their state assembly person is, and they're not engaged. There's smaller and smaller turnouts taking place in the election. We see the influence of different groups that control the different elections that we have. So, most people don't participate in this process. So we're not gonna, so we, so we need to focus, not for those of us that wanna see our state be the best it can be and become the empire state again. We have to focus not just on what needs to be reformed, but much more importantly, on how are we gonna get it reformed? How are we gonna get the interest of our elected officials at the state level to pay attention to these concerns? Because right now, their incentive, what's their incentive to make these very tough decisions? Because they're hard. It's easy to vote to pass things that people like. It's hard to make changes, especially since you're not gonna lose your seat anyway. If you do try and change things and go against the, you may lose your committee chairmanship, you may lose your campaign uh, contributions, you may lose the troops that support you on the street, 
You may lose all the things that keep you in the position that you're in. So what incentive do you have to make these very tough decisions to change things? Morally, we all believe it's the right thing to do. We all believe that they should do it. But we have to create an incentive for elected officials to want to make these changes. That incentive will only come from the public, that more people get interested and involved in demanding these changes to take place. And so the focus has got to be on how do we get more people involved in the electoral process that want to see these changes take place. Because we can, we're can, we going to spend a lot of time here tonight talking about what needs to be done. This should be done, that should be done, this should be done, that should be done. But it won't happen unless we get the elected officials to make the changes. Many of those changes against their self-interest. Redistricting reform, probably one of the most important. You need competitive elections. You must have people compete. Our society is based upon competition. Capitalism is based upon competition. You have a good product, you have a good service, you have a better price, you're gonna get the, the market share. That's what politics, democracy is based upon as well. I've got a better idea, I've got a better service, I've got a better way to do things, I can do it cheaper, I can do it better, I should win. But that doesn't happen. In 60 or 70% of the races, there's either no opponent, or the opponent is someone who's just put up there by the party that really can't win, and they spend less than $1,000 on the race. So the only way that you'll change things is by having competitive elections, where people realize, by doing the right thing, the good thing, I win. By not doing anything, I lose. That's a very big challenge for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, thank you very much. Um, I kind of pick up on a theme that uh, Tom Swazi raised because uh, Tom went around the state uh, last year and in uh, a real yeoman's effort to educate the public on the nature and the causes of the, of the state's high property tax burden. And I think really did a very good job of that. And is more familiar with the issues and with the responses and the choices that the state faces than most people. Uh, after the hearings you held and, and uh, you know, the paper that was issued by the Swazi Commission. Uh, one thing I noticed as being uh, part of the, the kind of traveling roadshow uh, around the, the Commission on Property Tax Relief was also the way that the knowledge of our high tax burden gave birth to a sort of fallacy. And the thought was that if we had very high property taxes, we could solve the problem simply by shifting those taxes to the state level. Now, as it happens, state taxes in total in New York are not extremely high, do not rank in the top 10 after, among other things, relative to personal income by national statistical measures, but those measures are misleading. In New York, half of our sales tax rate, which is pretty high, at over 8% on average, is collected by local governments and thus is not counted as a state tax because the local governments, the counties principally in the city of New York, need it to pay for their share of the Medicaid, which is still a large amount of money even though it's been kept. If you simply took the state tax burden, uh, the local tax burden, and shifted enough of it to the state level to make the local tax burden really competitive in, in line with, say, the national median, you'd have the heaviest state tax burden in the country. So the real problem at, at bottom, is, as Tom also alluded to, is the cost of government in New York. And that's been a problem for a while, although it's ebbed and flowed. I'd like to talk a little about that, because we, we're here tonight because we know we have a problem, and that we know we need to get those costs under control. I think it's fair to ask the question, though, after all, why should we? I mean, after all, uh, um, you know, what does our tax structure look like? Is it competitive? And the answer is that even during the boom years, it was the tax structure was not competitive in many respects. And it had a serious flaw, which many of us pointed to, which was obvious and which has now been proven. It was dangerously over-dependent on uh, revenues generated by the rising incomes of a relatively small number of wealthy people and high roads. And that was obvious for years. It became more dependent on those people just in the last 10 years, even more so than it had been in the 80s and, and before that. In fact, that was not a feature of New York State's tax structure until the 1980s. We were never as dependent on the wealthy as we became in the 80s and 90s, and became more so after the last round of Pataki tax cuts, which favored the middle class and lower income people over the wealthy who got the smaller tax cuts and made the tax structure more progressive. So by 19, 2007, the top 1% of uh, earners in New York State were generating 40% of the state income tax, which is our largest revenue source. 
That's why we have a big problem today. And we're, it's almost identical to California's revenue problem. Uh, and we're pro now approaching on, on our own scale California's budget problem. So during the period of 2003 to 2008, and this is true of the city as well as the state, we had a record increase in real terms in state tax revenues, which fueled an increase in spending during George Pataki's last five years in office of so roughly 40%. Even with that spending increase, so much revenue was coming in that Pataki left his successor, Elliot Spitzer, with an official budget surplus of $3 billion. Um, and there was another billion uh, squirreled away in various nooks and crannies in the budget. So he had a considerable cushion. That cushion was gone within about nine months. And at the moment, we are falling deeply, ever more deeply, into a very bottomless, what appears to be a bottomless pit. State Comptroller just today said that it appears we have a $4 billion deficit in the current fiscal year, which would point to a debt, if, if not resolved quickly, which it's not, doesn't appear to be likely, is going to turn into a $9 billion gap next year, growing the gaps in the next few years of pro probably exceeding $20 billion in a single year out to 2013. That's really, really big by, stand, by any standard. This is clear, easily the worst fiscal crisis in New York State since the 1970s. It's the worst fiscal crisis the state itself has faced that, that is originating in all of <coughs> ever. In the modern history of the state, of the post-war growth of state government, this is the worst situation the state government has ever faced. And again, it's getting worse by the day. I will say, though, that if, if this is a good time to look back on the lesson of the, of the fiscal crisis of the 1970s that was focused in New York City. While different in some ways in its specifics of its origin, it has a lot of object lessons. And there's grounds for pessimism and there's ground for optimism coming from that. The grounds for pessimism are the fiscal crisis, if you read the history of it and follow the contemporaneous coverage or maybe even experience parts of it, demonstrated the seemingly boundless capacity for self-delusion among city politicians and frankly among the electorate and the state and city level. The, the, the looming fiscal crisis, which people in both parties at different levels of government were beginning to warn of years earlier, was essentially a non-issue in political campaigns, almost to the moment that the city was shut out of the credit markets. Abe Bean was elected mayor, after all, because he knew the buck. Um, so, and then everything collapsed, and the city had to do truly disruptive, massive cuts to make up for the problems that had been created. Now. Flash forward to now, I think that the, the grounds for optimism are, is, is the response to that crisis and the lessons that state, on the, especially on the state level, that were learned from that. Because if you look at what led up to the fiscal crisis, it's often associated with sloppy fiscal practices, short-term borrowing, and excessive spending, all of which is true. The unspoken aspect of the fiscal crisis is that it was preceded by year after year of really enormous tax increases. John Lindsay and Nelson Rockefeller, in tandem in the 1960s, had raised city and state taxes to unbelievably high levels. And then, after the go-go stock market of 1969 turned bearish and after we had recessions in the 1970s, they did more. They added to that. They did further significant increases on top of that. Huge increases, very big increases of 50% to doubling in the, in the sales tax, state and city level. Uh, several percentage points more on top of what was already a double-digit state income tax. Uh, increasing the city income tax, expanding the unincorporated business tax to broad classes of business that hadn't been touched. Big, big, big tax increases on a sinking economy. That is what really did things in and helped soften everything up for the collapse. Uh, and you know, the, the oil crisis, national economic conditions helped push things over the brink, but by then the city was vulnerable. The lesson learned and it's very clearly learned was that there was a broad political consensus and a, a, an agreement in New York that, that things had gone too far, that taxes were too high, that the tax structure was wildly out of sync with anything that could be considered consecutive, uh, competitive. And under the next two state administrations, there were significant reductions and reform of, of state taxes in particular and reform of the state tax code. The two great supply side heroes in the history of New York, if you were to ask a supply sider to identify them, supply siders being guys who are fixated on marginal tax rates, would be you carry and Mario Cuomo. Under you carry, the state's top marginal rate went from 15% to 
Under Mario Cuomo, it went from 10% to 7.9%. George Pataki was icing on the cake at the, cake at the end, and as I said, his tax cut was largely targeted to the middle class. The real supply side heroes were Carey and Cuomo. And they were acting, and, and in Cuomo's case, dragged along by the state senate to a degree. But he didn't resist too strenuously. Uh, they were acting again in line with that civic consensus that followed the fiscal crisis. Lessons were learned. By the 1990s, the state and local tax burden in New York measured by the, the uh, what I think is the best measure, which is the tax foundation measure relative to the size of the economy that takes account of where taxes are paid and kind of ships out some of the non-resident taxes and really focuses on it the right way. It had gone down about 30% from its peak in the 1970s, the combined state and local tax burden. Now, it still ranked, depending on which year it looked at in the late 90s, it still ranked first or second in the country. That's because we were so wildly out of line. But it was nearly 30% lower than it had been. And that was around 1999. Since then, we've been going back uphill with a reef plateau during the period of 03 08. And the problem is this year is that we're reverting to form. What was done in the state budget this year was the governor proposed a budget that had a small spending increase in it, which was wildly unaffordable to start with. Then the Fed stepped in and gave us, in terms of what was on budget just for this year alone, $6.2 billion. Basically telling a heroin addict that I'm going to help you with your problem, come into my living room and smoke this crack. Uh, the budget was finally resolved by taking that $6.2 billion, adding it to what the governor proposed, and adding to, more, adding to that billions more in spending financed by a tax and fee increase, new taxes and fees of $6 billion the largest tax, new tax and fee increase in New York State's history, um, $4 billion of which was a personal income tax increase, on top of which we did $2 billion in MTA regional taxes and fees. And now we have the problem I outlined to you at the beginning of my presentation. After those tax increases, the state's top tax rate was increased 31% on people earning over half a million dollars a year in a way that, by the way, makes it a flat rate going right back to the first dollar. It was increased 31%. The latest quarterly estimated payments for the month of September, the third quarter of the calendar year, second quarter of the fiscal year, estimated payments made principally by wealthy taxpayers were down 17% from last year, with a 31% increase in their tax rate. So basically, this is returning to the days of yore. Uh, we're basically headed back to the future, back to the 70s, in effect. Um, and I think that also we're seeing, frankly, in, in the way it's being dealt with and confronted or not confronted, uh, especially in Albany right now, a repeat of some of that self-delusion and, and, and uh, denial that we saw in the 1970s. Again, remember, and if you were there, I see some heads nodding in the room, people who can actually remember it, experiencing it, right up to the moment the city was shut out of the credit markets and was essentially insolvent. It was not an it was not an all-consuming issue. It was not a big a, a driving political issue. Almost to that moment, in fact, a year or two before that, the city's credit rating had been increased. Increased. It'd been improved. So I, th th this and we're not that's not going to happen now. And the state is in worse shape than the city structurally. But the state, unlike the city, can take everything down with it because everybody is below the state and downstream the state. So I think we can learn, though. So what am I saying in short? Yes, we are on our way rapidly to becoming in, as, in the same bad shape as California. No, we won't be issuing IOUs next spring, because I don't think, because they still have a billion dollars in a short-term investment pool that they can use to cover their cash flow problems. But uh, certainly in relative terms, we're going to be in California territory very soon. Uh, politically, we're already rapidly getting there for a different set of reasons. California does have a good example for us of, uh, that I'll close with of where we should be headed. Uh, although they're not making much progress that I can see yet in actually getting their budget gap under control, they, the governor of California and the legislature appointed something called the Commission on the 21st Century Economy, which recommended a complete overhaul of California's tax code. The principal elements of what they suggested for California would be good ideas for New York, and we ought to start thinking of them now. There's no time like the present. The main elements were they said, take our income tax, broaden the base and flatten it so that it becomes less volatile and less reliant on and less progressive in a way that will result in no tax increase for a small tax cut for everybody, at least a small one. They take their rate, which is now something like 10 point, I think it's 10.5% at the moment, at the very top right now. 
they take it down to something like two and a half for everyone. I think it would be a two rate structure, but very, very flat, very, very broad. Uh, eliminate the sales tax. That's right, eliminate the sales tax. Also, eliminate the corporate tax. Eliminate the corporate tax. Adopt in their place a business, a, basically a business gross receipts tax of 4% that would apply to all business receipts. Now, that's an interesting idea. I can think of some problems that would create. I can think of some unintended consequences. I can think of the political firestorm that would greet some aspects of that. But that's the kind of breakthrough thinking we need to start doing here now. Not thinking about how many holes, more holes are growing in the dike and how to plug them. The dike is falling down. It's already falling down. Uh, there's going to need to be massive structural changes. We ought to be looking toward the future and thinking about learning from this the way we did in the past. And, you know, in closing, I think the main question we need to face is, do we need to relive something as severe as the fiscal crisis, perhaps more so, perhaps broader and longer lasting? Do we need to relive something like that in order to relearn those lessons? That's the key question. Uh, to bring some greater order and rationality to its fist. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, we have a moment of opportunity. We have a deep fiscal crisis, and we have a crisis of democracy converging. Now, uh, we, we need solutions. And it's been my long uh, and strongly held view that we won't get solutions, as again uh, Tom pointed out. And I must note Tom's passion in bringing uh, this message to audiences throughout the state. He was in Marlboro, New York, and I saw him speak there, and, and, uh, and so he's certainly doing his part. We, have, we can't count on the people in power to change the structure of the system in ways that will constrain them or bring a hope uh, to uh, New Yorkers. So we must find a way to go around the people in power to bring change to you. We do not have the initiative and referendum, and some would argue that if we had that remedy, we'd be switching California's crisis for New York's crisis. We do have a mandated process for constitutional change that bypasses the people in power. In fact, all constitutions in this country all 51 of them have a process to go around the people in power because of the presumption that occasionally they will not wish to change the structures of government because they benefit from it. And that includes the national constitution, though we rarely use that, that opportunity. In New York, it happens to be a mandatory constitutional question that we, can, that, that we offer to the voters every 20 years, last offered in 1997. So, one immediate disability of my remedy is that the opportunity doesn't arise converging with the crisis. And that's something that we have to take hard of. And I'll come back to that point. And this mandatory question is on the ballot. Ask New Yorkers if they want to have a constitutional uh, convention to amend the, cons revise the, amend the Constitution or revise the same. That language is in the state constitution. Uh, and then if New Yorkers say yes, we elect delegates to a constitutional convention. And those delegates meet and give consideration to the structures of government and, and some of the disabilities of our, of, our, uh, of our system, the systemic issues. And then they come to uh, proposed remedies and they offer those remedies to New Yorkers and New Yorkers get to say whether they want those remedies or not. I bring to your, uh, I raise to your attention the fact that there are three votes involved in such a process. It's a democratic process that relies, relies on the people three times. It relies on the people to select delegates to the convention. It relies on the, uh, it relies on the people to decide they want such a meeting. It relies on them to select delegates, and then it relies on them to approve or disapprove of the consequences of the, of the choices the delegates offer. Now, there are, and I, I argue that this remedy which can either be given us by the legislature, it can call such a convention, or that we can take on the, at, the, at the moment of the automatic uh, question put forward. Um, this remedy offers us a hope to address some of the fundamental fiscal issues that we've been talking about, some of the fundamental issues of democracy we've been talking about, some of the fundamental questions of accountability at the polls that we've been discussing. I recently wrote a, an op-ed piece that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. I co-authored it with Mario Cuomo, and we argued that a convention was necessary. And uh, the uh, naysayers came forward, and I'm going to talk a little about that. If there's always a you found when you were professor that they talk very long. So jump up in five minutes. I have to make a mistake. And uh, the, the governor called me and said, people are asking me, what would we do in such we need to write another. And I said, well, we can have a fair method for legislative districting, not gerrymandered, not gerrymandered by those in power to stay in power. We have a process for campaign financing that diminishes the influence of big money and enhances competitiveness in our system. I call that paying for the heat and light of democracy because it's part of the overhead. We can have elections administered by professionals, not by political appointees, through what is the residual of the patronage system. <coughs> we can restore the proper balance between the legislative and executive branches in such areas as budgeting and filling vacancies in public office, a concern that some of us 
I have because we believe the recent uh, Court of Appeals decision was wrongly uh, decided. Um, we can have an ethics provision, as, the one, as is the case in Rhode Island, that modernizes and realizes the Constitution's anti-corruption provisions. And there are such provisions in the Constitution now. We can have a unified court system. We can have a merit selection of judges. We can have a rational system of local government. Now, I'm from upstate New York, um, differently defined by different people. But uh, the layered system of local government that we have is the consequence of, of, of uh, well, Henry Hudson didn't have anything to do with it. So I can't say 400 years of history, but a long history of uh, accretion without adding, without removing. Okay, so I have my list, other people have their list. What do the naysayers uh, argue? And I'll try to go quickly. Go quickly. It's always dangerous when your pages are out of order. There are, there are uh, three arguments, really. I think the first I characterize as nothing will change if we have a convention. The second I characterize as everything will change if we have a convention. <laughs> And the third, I'd say, summarizes as the wrong thing will change if we have a convention. Now, all of this is a, is, is a, 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 a conviction or it's still an attempt to instill a conviction that fear will always triumph over hope. That if we rely on democracy, bad things will happen. Now, the first argument is based on the notion that we'll elect the wrong people, the same people who run the state now will control, they'll get another salary, they'll get more money, they won't do anything uh, serious. In fact, the Constitution that was passed in 1967 had a commission to, uh, to draw legislative districts. If we had that Constitution today and had only that provision, we'd have competitive elections in New York. And that, that Constitution lost because of an error in presenting the, the document to the people. We can also pass laws, and I have some ideas about this, against dual office holding that would prevent somebody from being in the legislature and being a delegate at the same time. I wouldn't preclude them from running for delegate, but I'd preclude them from sitting in both offices simultaneously, which is a common practice in New York. Second argument, everything might change. Well, we can't, most of us believe, we pay any attention to this, believe we can't have a limited convention just to fix one thing or another because of the nature of our constitutional requirement, the question that's asked. There's some debate among the law professors on this, but I think it probably it's not possible to have a limited constitution for the nation. So the argument is Pandora's box will be open. Those of you who are familiar with Greek mythology you know this is an anti-feminist uh, characterization, but I won't go I, 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 I won't go into that for the moment uh, in the interest of time. Pandora's box will be open and un unleash a host of evils upon New York. Now we have already heard that we're suffering under a host of evils. So what's the marginal risk? Interesting question. Secondly, uh, politically, a lot of the things that people say will be undone will not be undone. We will not remove the Adirondack and Castle Preserves, constitutional protection of the Adirondack and Castle Preserves, because if we present such a document to the people, they'll reject it. So there's a political dimension to our consideration, not just a structural dimension to our consideration. Now, if you talk to people, and there's still a few left, who were delegates to the 67 Convention, you'll see that they knew they were involved in a very special undertaking, and they took very special responsibility. It was a political moment. But they knew they were making a constitution. People who made the city charter, as uh, uh, Frank helped do, knew they were, they were doing something special. It's a different sort of assembly. It has one purpose, like the College of Cardinals. No, I'm a Jew. I think I understand what they do. You know, uh, they assemble, they do one big thing, and they disperse, if I've got it right. Now, uh, maybe not, who knows. <laughs> the third argument, wrong things will change. Well, liberals don't like the state senate districts because they're used to elect Republicans. Well, we don't have, they don't have to worry that, about that anymore. We saw that we got it at least the marginal for now, a marginal Democrat majority. Uh, Republicans don't like the majority of New Yorkers being enrolled as Democrats. So every side thinks that they'll lose the election. Consequently, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't do it because they won't win. So it's a fear against hope. Now, uh, there's some voting rights, potential voting rights issues. I won't go into the detail. I think that we can elect delegates to a constitutional convention. I will pledge here tonight that I will run. Uh, 
uh, that, that will be putting myself aside, uh, responsible, focused, and addressing the fundamental structural issues. Now, can we fix everything about New York in uh, any constitutional kind of religion? Of course we can't fix everything about New York. Can we agree about everything that should, should, should be done by such a body? No, we can't. But we can make elections more democratic. We can make, we can, we can rip control of the political system from, from uh, the moneyed interests, who by the way are not only or principally rich people, but labor unions. We essentially have the, the, the employees hiring the management. And there are consequences to that. So we can do some structural things of importance that will put us on the right path. Perhaps we can find a, a binding method for revenue estimating that will put the cap that Tom mentioned on the revenue number and say, you guys are going to have to make your decision within this number. Now let's go back to the story of Pandora's box. This is too good. <laughs> I'm sorry. When Pandora first opened the box, all these evils escaped. What was left? Does anybody know? Hope. Hope was still in the box. Hope was too weak to fly out. And in one version of the story, Pandora returned and released hope. The function of a constitutional convention is to release hope in New York, to mobilize New Yorkers' expectation and desire for effective, democratic, accountable, and affordable government. We can work toward it. If we can't get the legislature to uh, embrace the opportunity, we can work toward it so we'll be ready when we have the opportunity. And that's what I call upon you to do. Thank you. Thank you. What we do now is we'll let the panelists exchange, engage and exchange among each other, and then we'll turn it over to you for questions. Tom, you want to yeah, the first thing I'll say is that, you know, the reason that things don't change is because there are a lot of people that benefit from the status quo. And the people that benefit from the status quo work very hard to keep the status quo. That's just the basic, you know, health insurance right now. Everybody's been talking about we had to reform health insurance for 40 years in the United States of America. And there are people that benefit from the current system. They're spending an awful lot of money to try and make sure we keep the status quo and they're trying to prevent things from changing. Now, Jerry, tell us how <clears throat> those that want to preserve the status quo, how would we overcome their concerns to make a constitutional convention happen? What, is, what are the steps that would take place for a constitutional convention to happen in New York State? Well, EJ and I have been going to meetings about this, so we, um, he may wish to add to, the, to what I have to say. Uh, maybe I've ratted him out, he doesn't have the world to know he's doing that. <laughs> um, first, we have to address the process question. We have, to, we have to pass, and that requires passing law about process, because the Constitution specifies process. So the state legislature would have to pass the law. Well, but, so then the question is, yes, they would. And it's a catch-22, which is another illusion of more contemporary, literary illusion of more contemporary age. You know, it's a catch-22. But my view is right now that we should, con my view has been, in the meetings I've been going to, that we should confront our elected officials with an agenda of legislative and constitutional process changes to take away the arguments that the same people will be elected, that the status quo will be reinforced. The same people are making the argument that the status quo will be reinforced as are benefiting from the status quo because they don't want change. It's, so, so here is our agenda, Mr. Assemblyman. Do you endorse it or not? Here's our agenda, Mr. Candidate for Governor. Do you endorse it or not? You know, so make it an issue in the current campaign. Have an agenda for, for, for change. Every step, every refusal becomes a brick with which to build the edifice, and the metaphor fails, you know, becomes a resource when the ultimate opportunity rises. It's discouraging that we can't force the, 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 the action now under the current provisions of the Constitution. So that is the second best, the second best um, um, process. One of the things that I've, I've had to deal with over the years, what I've what when I did fix Albany, you know, the key, you know, I, when I fought for the cap on Medicaid, the public doesn't really care about the cap on Medicaid. They don't really care that we spend as much on pensions, or they, care, they don't care that we spend so much on education. They don't really care about a lot of the stuff we talked about tonight. 
So we have to make sure, if we're gonna try and get a political movement to hold people accountable, we have to tie the dysfunction that exists directly to things that people are genuinely concerned about. Now the number one concern of people that live in Nassau County, Suffolk County, Westchester County, Rockland County, Putnam County, and many upstate counties are property taxes. That's what they care about the most. We need to have an equivalent concern by the people who live in the five boroughs. What do they, what do people care about? Because we must tie these concerns that we've talked about in ways that only we show up for the meetings for to something that people care about. We must say, if we do this, it'll affect the thing that you care about. So we have to, you have to tie the constitutional convention or whatever reform it is we're seeking to something they care about. For me, for the people that I represent in Nassau County, it's property taxes. So we have to decide, what is it for the five people in the five boroughs? Uh, I would, I just want to acknowledge that I am formally enlisted in the informal cabal of people. <laughs> We're meeting, with Jerry, joking, we're Jerry, meeting with Jerry Benjamin in different secure locations to fly <laughs> about what might happen, about how a, a constitutional convention might be brought about. I'm not sure you mentioned this, Jerry, but um, there, I, we should point out that the Constitution does re, uh, uh, provide for an automatic vote by the people every 20 years. Um, and and I, I, I'm sorry, but, but it's next 2017 would be the next day that nothing happened. Uh, in eight years, you're going to have a vote no matter what on whether to have a constitutional convention. To force it sooner, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I always get this mixed up with other things, even though we've been talking about it. You, a constitution otherwise can be called only the way the constitution itself can be amended, which is the legislature, has, the governor has nothing to do with it, actually. The legislature has to pass a concurrent resolution, both houses, two years in a row, but they have to be two years in two different sessions. Was it only one? Only one. Okay, only once they have to pass. A concurrent resolution to put it on the ballot. That's that's fair. Enough, but the re legislature has to pass a resolution to put the question on the ballot, and then if the voter shall there be a convention, and then if the voters say yes, the following year you will elect delegates to the convention, and then the year after that the convention convenes. I'm among the many most conservatives, other than I think John Faso, uh, formally opposed the convention along with most liberals in 1997 for the reasons Jerry stated. Bad things will happen. Things we don't want will happen. Um, my own feeling is that, from my point of view, it couldn't possibly get any worse. If, if bad things happen, how could you tell? Um, I, how would we know? Uh, I wouldn't know that historically in New York, there have been errors in the past of, of profound um, 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 alienation from New York politics of disgust, of popular disgust with goings on in Albany, with feelings that it was dysfunctional and corrupt. The Constitution has been amended several times in the past to address past financial abuses and crises. It has a crystal clear, unequivocal provision that flatly says that the, no, that the state shall contract no debt without voter approval. And right now, we've got about $50 billion in state debt contracted without voter approval because the courts basically not withstood that, that provision. It has a provision that said you shall not make a gift or loan of state goods to a private person. You can't just like give state resources to a private party. Just yesterday, the governor and the legislature happily announced a gift, essentially the gift, economic development grants by another name of millions of dollars to various people around the state, including a million and a half dollars to some guy to develop a hotel in Albany who's $600,000 in a rerun on city taxes. And there's other provisions, there's anti-corruption provisions as Jerry mentioned. These things obviously need to be updated and made more watertight. So I think it would be an opportunity. And in, in the fiscal situation, they need limits. They, there need to be limits uh, applied to the budgeting process so uh, to prevent the situation from getting as out of hand as it has gotten. Let me, if I may. Uh, I just, what strikes me is how desperate this situation must be. If within this state, people who are making an argument for change have to make it around the holding of a constitutional convention that won't take place for at least somewhere close to 10 years. By which time, if everything continues the way it is going, the population of New York will be in Nevada, South Carolina, Florida, and other places. The 
out-migration of people from New York, people who have the capacity to move, is occurring in a dramatic way. And by the time the Constitutional Convention meets, the people who will be able to be there will not have people who have anything worth preserving. That's the condition that we're in. I don't know, I mean, I agreed to set this panel up, but I haven't heard any, yeah, Jerry says hope, but hope is so far away. We right now have a governor with an approval rating of 20%, with an opportunity to put forward a program for reform that recognizes the reality that everyone here is talking about. There's no difference here. Of course, we had, at that point, the banks were lending money to the government instead of the government giving money to the banks. We have a different situation here. And the dynamic of, of, of the private sector is much more real. Most of, the com most of those companies in the control board are no longer here. And every one of the companies that are here in business in New York is indebted to local government, state government. We are in a state that's quite unlike anything in our history. And that's the reality. The reality is we are in Marxist New York. Me, if I may, I, um, Tom, one of the problems is that nobody's for the public interest. Everybody's for particular interests. And your question is... Except us. Um, it depends. Please don't attack SUNY <laughs> until I leave them. Right. They, analytically, that's what you're saying. You know, how, do you, how do you make it in the particular interest of people to be for the public interest? Understanding that we will, all won't agree on the particulars of the public interest. We will, we will agree on coming together to have a fair fight with an outcome. Fight might be the wrong characterization. Let me tell you a little story. In 1967, I was staff head of the Constitution Commission. The Commission, uh, Governor Cuomo, in 1964 uh, and 5 and 6, I was head of the staff head of the Commission. Governor Cuomo appointed to get ready for a convention vote in 1997. Jewish holidays, I was coming out of my synagogue and I was campaigning across the state. Uh, when invited to, to make the, some of the arguments I made today, I'm persistent. And uh, this fellow stops me, he's head of the, uh, uh, the teachers union in our local uh, school district. He's a, uh, you know, co parishioner member of my system. He says to me, why do you want to take my pension? <laughs> I said, it's a high holy day, I'm not going to discuss this in front of this. <laughs> Which wasn't a dodge, it was really the way I felt. His union had convinced him that if there was such a meeting, he would, his pension rights would be compromised. And that the mobilization of, 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 uh, of, of, of organized labor, and you know, without malevolence, the, the political mobilization of organized labor defeated the convention vote that year, quite decisively. Now, in New York City in the 70s, members of unions became convinced that if the city collapsed, tens of thousands of people would be hired, would be fired, would lose their job. So the primary concern was, how do we help? What do we, how do we help New York City get through this crisis? And that conviction dictated support of a remedy. So are we in a moment where the consequences are so potentially dire for the people who ordinarily would resist consideration of alternatives that they will perforce consider. Yeah. And can we convince them of that? So going back to your religious analogy, the College of Cardinals would tell you that the, you know, we need to seek the common good. That's what our objective should be, certainly in public life. We should seek the common good. And there's a concern that different groups, including unions, as it was back in the 1990s, uh, would be concerned about a constitution. And, and uh, unions have a very, very influential role 
in our contemporary politics. We saw the Working Families Party had such a big role in the turnout in the um, uh, elections that we just had in runoffs. And the very low turnout races, but they were very effective in getting candidates elected. So we have to figure out how can we, because you're not going to beat these groups. You're not going to just say, you know, you're, you're the problem and we're going to take away your pension. And I don't recommend that we that, that be the, the step, the way that we do it. There's going to have to be an effort to help bring together different interests from labor unions and business to see that it's in the common good of all of us to address these issues. That, you know, is there, are there lessons to be learned from what happened in Detroit? What were the faults of management and what were the faults of labor that contributed to the decline of the auto industry here in the United States of America? And so we need to do the same thing with public employee unions here in New York State that, and with businesses here in New York State to bring them together to say, listen, if we continue on the existing path that we have, we're going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And we need to educate. Everyone needs to understand that. I think that everyone needs to understand labor's legitimate concern, that they want to make sure that people have a decent wage and that they, if they're willing to work hard and work every week, that they should be able to have a wage and health insurance and a pension and retire and security one day. That's, I don't think anybody's, even EJ's not against that. He's for that. He just thinks it. He just thinks, <laughs> he just thinks it's gotten too far. So we need to do a better job of educating all the different parties involved that there is a common good that we can all benefit from, that everybody can win in the process. So we need to figure out, you know, so we need to figure out how can the different parties benefit from this process. A crisis puts us in that situation. I don't think we are there yet. I think that, like your concern that you discussed earlier, that in the 1970s, up until the total collapse ha happened, nobody was even talking about it. And I think we're on the precipice of that type of collapse happening here in New York State. I don't think we're here, there yet. And I don't think that everybody's sufficiently motivated yet to have, sit down and have that conversation. Uh, I rarely use this word, but I'm becoming more and more appreciative of its value the longer I've been in public life, is that you really need leadership. You need people, I, I hate using the word leadership, I think it's overused in life, but you really need leadership. You need the leadership to bring together the disparate interests that are involved here to realize that why there's a common good that can be served, both for, and these are just two examples of parties that usually don't be on the same page, business and labor, but there are other groups as well, that can have the same interest served uh, through a common good effort uh, to try and find a solution. One second, I want to turn this over to the audience. I just want to add one sour thought. Um, for many interests, slow decline is preferable to compromise. And that's one of the dangers we face. That like, like the frog that gets parboiled uh, in the water, that that's the kind of situation we're in. And when we say bringing business and, and, and labor together, the problem is business and labor is together. Large businesses cut their separate deals with the state government. Labor cuts its deal with the state government. What gets squeezed is the middle class. And it's very hard to mobilize the middle class. I mean, put my two cents in. Let me turn it over to you, Brent, in the audience. Brent, just a second. I, I'm going to read an email that I just got. I, I'm on my way out of the country. That's why I'm trying to catch up. Let, let me read the email. It came, its subject is, it's very apropos to what we're talking about today. Call from Governor Patterson. Uh, this is from Ken Adams from the Business Council. I wanted to let you know that this afternoon Governor Patterson called to inform me that tomorrow he will be making an important budget announcement. As you know, the state is facing a current year deficit of about three billion. The Business Council has been advocating forcefully for state spending cuts to eliminate the deficit and to prepare for the upcoming 2000. 10, 11 budget. Last week, the governor announced 500 million in executive cuts, a step in the right direction. In response, the Business Council recognized that move and pressed for more. As we called for immediate across the board, 6% reduction in state spending. The governor did not reveal the details of what he intends to announce tomorrow, but he suggested to me that the approach was in keeping with the remarks that he made at our recent annual meeting, and he asked for us to be supportive. 
We anticipate that his proposal will require legislative approval and will be intensely opposed by many interests. In that case, the governor will need our strong and vocal support. We will be sure to keep you informed of important developments tomorrow, but of course, how you can assist with the forward. Thank you, Ken Adams. So, there may be a light at the end of the tunnel other than the train coming at us from the other end of the tunnel. Uh, that's, that's encouraging. I mean, hopefully the governor will step up to the plate. Um, let me turn it over to you and the audience. Um, just, just stand up and, uh, can people hear me? Just, just stand up and just say who you are and, and then Joe. I'm a Laird Towns and a fan of all these assembled panelists. Um, at, the t at this time when the state is entering into an unprecedentedly awful fiscal and economic situation, we have the rise of the Working Families Party, which has been alluded to. The Working Families Party is, is in a state of denial, you might say, about the effect of taxes on uh, business and individuals in New York State. They and a number of other legislature, le legislators don't believe they matter. So their preferred solution still is more taxes. They don't want to touch pensions. They don't want to uh, change Taylor or Triborough. They don't want to have contracts that change Taylor. provisions for employees. Taylor law keeps um, Tribal amendment keeps all provisions of a contract in place uh, even after they have expired. So steps and other things can continue to get paid and nothing goes away. Taylor law sets the basic parameters for negotiating between public sector managers and employees. My question is a really a practical one. What specific things can you think of to do to counter their growing power where they can pick off legislators or put new ones in uh, in races of their choice. Should we start a new jobs party? Should we more selectively or rigorously enforce uh, campaign finance laws? What is the answer here if there is one? Nothing will happen in the short term. Uh, this is a, the Working Families Party is an effective organization that has built its influence over a long period of years doing effective organizing. Business groups of New York State are ineffective when it comes to campaigning, providing troops and money, uh, and there's not an equal counterbalance to them in any way. So it would be years and of organizing that would be necessary to impact that change. Not that I'm suggesting that there, there shouldn't be an effort to spend years to organize people for a particular interest. I encourage all groups to do that. I, that's what America is about. Uh, but I don't think that idea that, like that's happening in the short term uh, to have a counterbalance uh, to the Working Families Party. And they do represent a large group of people. I just want to, so I think we need to be thinking in terms of, you know, there, you know, it's, it's, it is a, a, a sour note that if it's, if it's true that we cannot stop people from just letting slow decline happen, and if they will not compromise, and just will allow slow decline to happen. So there needs to be an effort to, number one, can work on the Working Family Party and their leadership to understand their moral responsibility that they have to address the problem that we all face, now that they have as much influence as they do. And number two, to try and articulate a cogent argument as to why it's in their self-interest to see the state of New York succeed. So for example, you know, we all know there's been a declining union membership in New York State and the United States of America over the past three decades. Maybe there's an opportunity to increase union membership, but to do so, you need to have more successful businesses and you need to have more successful growth taking place in New York State, which will require a change in the status quo. So uh, that may be Pollyannish of me, but uh, I tried it another way. It didn't work out very well for me. <laughs> Alaire, a couple of years ago, Fred and I were both on the commission, uh, the Charter Revision Commission, and we suggested something called nonpartisan elections. And it was defeated. It was defeated in an election by a significant percentage because people didn't come out to vote. It, it was in an off year, and we timed it inappropriately. But the issue really, what 
Fred wrote a piece that is absolutely brilliant. It talked about the suppression of the Democratic Party, which was done by the Democrats. The Democratic Party has no interest in promoting primary voting. The Democratic Party has an interest. It's an interest group. And the fewer that vote, the stronger they are, they believe. The working parties undercut that. They undercut that by mobilizing in a primary that the Democrats have already established to be insignificant. And so one answer, and, and therefore they had a, an enormous role in an election which, in which 7% or so of the Democratic primary voters participated. So one solution that would be a real solution is to have nonpartisan elections. Nonpartisan elections that would therefore allow us to vote in November. Campaign finance law, and I was, a, the first, I was on the first campaign finance board, is a sham. And it is a sham and a fraud. It is hands in the pocket of the voter, of the taxpayers. Why? Because the elections are non-competitive. The only election that is coming up in this city that, com that counts as a competitive election, and maybe one or two council manic districts, but it's essentially the mayoralty. And in that election, one of the candidates is not taking campaign finance money. In every other, the borough president's races without any opposition, all these guys are getting government funding. And what do they do with it? They create committees that don't do anything. They give money to their friends. It is the biggest ripoff, and in the name of democracy. There's no democracy here. It's a fraud. Campaign finance law in this state, the way it's done, again. Joe, tell us who you are. I'd like to just go back to the question that's on the, the program here. Uh, can New York government be reformed? To me, that's more a process issue than a policy issue. A lot of you, you spend a lot of time talking about policy today. And my, my, own, uh, my own way of describing the problem is that the people, the only people who can fix the problem are those uh, who are part of the problem, and that doesn't seem to be changing. And, and you've talked about some possibilities, but even you know, in terms of a constitutional convention, you're still gonna have to go back to the usual suspects to produce delegates in a political process that is still gonna have a hard time turning out people in local elections, because any political scientist knows the more local something is, the less participation you have. And even if you think that the governor uh, you know, might come up with a plan tomorrow, he still has to go back to the same legislature. So to me, the problem is very obvious, is that the only people who can fix it are benefited from it. And, and I don't see a path around that, right? including the Constitutional Convention. So if we're going to answer the question, yes, then you have to Tell me what that path is, and I haven't heard it yet. I, I, I'd like to start with an answer to that from my observation on New York government. First, I begin with a prediction. If, it, if New York State government is not meaning, meaningfully reformed, whatever that means, but in ways I think we would all agree are, are reforms, that is, doesn't get its act together, doesn't do things that relieve pressure to, for change. I would predict flatly that in 2017, people will, call, will vote for a constitutional convention. Absolutely, I think that absolutely will happen because it will be really, really, really bad by 2017. Seriously, I think that, I think I think there's I think that I love the Adam Smith quote. It's very useful in New York. You know, you know the famous letter the guy wrote to Adam Smith who, who, during the Revolution, his young friend, the American Revolution. He said, "Like the empire is ruined," and Adam Smith wrote back, "There's a lot of ruin in an empire. Um, there's a lot of ruin in the empire state." By which I mean. You can go on muddling through this, this appalling situation as it gets worse and worse and worse for years. With occasional federal bailouts, you know, fever highs on Wall Street that generate little spurts of revenue. Things can kind of muddle through in an screw, increasingly screwed up fashion until 2017. If that happens, people will have, will have a constitutional convention. And even under the default rules of election of delegates to a constitutional convention, that will be an opportunity for reform, I would suggest. That's my <coughs> prediction. Secondly, I'm absolutely convinced from everything I've seen in all of that. 
Well, I, if the world still exists in 2017, then we'll, we'll be here, because there's a lot of room in the empire. Um, but um, I, I think, um, I also think, I'm, I, I'm very, very convinced, and have been for a long time, I'm sure Jerry would agree in particular, from my observation at close hand of, of the way things work in Albany for a long time. The key actor in Albany is the governor. A governor who, as a matter of a priority, is committed to a reform agenda, a narrow reform agenda, not I'm for change and reform, but a governor who, by, ex by his example and by his agenda, is committed to accomplishing reform, either directly or indirectly, in a few ways, can be a powerful force for change. And the legislature will be tugged along by the governor. The legislature is, is a largely, is, is generally an inert and reactive force. It's not, and it doesn't take the initiative. You're not going to see the legislature reform things. However, if a governor seems to be getting um, mileage out of pushing for reform, there's a lot of things they would go along, I would suggest. And I think that could happen. I just want to again point out that. What this gentleman says is absolutely right. It's not going to be nonpartisan elections, constitutional convention, other changes that we'd like to see happen are what we want to happen. The question is how do we get those things to happen? How do we get, get things to happen? I'm, sorry, I'm not saying I'm not endorsing on anything in particular, but I had that comment. <laughs> but the, people want these changes to happen. But how do you get change to happen? There's only two ways to make it happen. One is through a political movement where you actually make elected officials realize that if they don't do the right thing, they'll lose. And you have to have an effective political message and organization or a, a, a particular individual like the governor that will make that happen. Or number two, you need to convince the existing holders of the levers of the status quo realize that it's in their self-interest to make change happen for their benefit as well as for the common good's benefit. But can, I, can I just say a couple of things? First of all, I didn't get into the particulars to the degree perhaps I might have. We can pass laws that assure uh, quite, diver laws. Wait, quite diverse outcomes in elections for a constitutional convention because we elect three members in each Senate district and 15 at large. And the, the question is, what election laws will there be? Will they part be partisan, nonpartisan? I mean, both will each person cast who, who votes and so on, which I, uh, will be beyond the scope of what I can talk about in this meeting. So, the presumption that outcomes are predictable given the fact that we're using these districts in a very different way is simply wrong because any analytic, any close analysis would suggest, you know, that, that quite different outcomes can occur if you change the rules of the game. On, uh, uh, on, on the Working Families Party, for one moment, uh, interest groups shouldn't be political parties. Uh, New York has a quite unusual party system and it should have a more typical party system. I'll, that, but that'll be the limit of what I'd say here. In general, six years is not a long time. My, my good friend Frank was off by 40%. It's not 10 years, it's six years. Um, you know, senators get elected for six years. We're, we're accustomed to that as a, as a term of office. Uh, so, uh, and your, the political process has to be, leadership is quite important, it has to be mobilized by leaders with a plan to affect outcomes either ultimately at, at the date where we are certain to have a vote or before. And that can be done. Mobilization to our political purposes with the elections we have on a, on a, on a biannual basis certainly can be done. This gentleman right here and then. <laughs> Dick Starkey, Swazi for Governor Campaign 2006. <laughs> if all the people said they were going to vote for me, Actually, I would have gotten 20%, not 19%. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the clear message of the panel for me, or I, the message that I hear, is that the most vulnerable component of reform is going to be pensions. And that scares me as a pensioner. It seems to me to be a huge sticking point. And I wonder if you could conceive of reform taking place without touching the pension? Well, first of all, New York City can't touch the existing pensions. We're not permitted to touch the existing pensions under the existing Constitution. And I think that any changes to the pension system would be on a prospective basis. Changes, you know, to bring us back to things we had as recently as 
1999, was it? As recently as 1999, changes were made in the, when the economy was booming in 1999, there were dramatic changes made to our pension system where people had to stop contributing to their pensions. And, uh, you know, I think that any changes that took place regarding pensions would have to be on a prospective basis. Is that required by law? Would, would, have, would, yeah, just sure. would you change that? No, the litigation would kill you. Would have to be prospective. Would, have to, would not affect anybody's existing pension, but it would affect new employees. And again, it's not what we have now is not sustainable. 2011, 2011, just about every government, probably in the United States of America, but certainly here in New York State, is going to be bombed with incredible increases in their pension bills. And they're going to be losing, at the same time, the stimulus money that they're getting. So here in New York State, we're going to see dramatic, dramatic increases in our pension bills for every local government. And we're going to see a loss of stimulus money at the same time. We are facing that. You want to know when the, when the, when the bill's going to be paid, and when you can really see that crisis really hit. It's January 1st of 2011, or September of 2010, when people are starting to prepare their budgets for 2011. Let's put that on a, 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 a tick. Yeah. Most of what you're talking about in terms of pensions really is, does not affect, would not affect a base pension. But if you examine what has happened with pensions through administrative action and through legislation that has sweetened the pensions far beyond what anybody who retired anticipated. Presently now, if you are in a Board of Education pension, and you're holding your money in an account that generates an interest, an interest-bearing account, the guaranteed interest rate is 8.5%. Now, I don't know who gets 8.5% on anything that's invested in a, in a secure payment. You just had a number of settlements that were made where people who worked at procession jobs, which when they had those jobs and agreed to work at them, were non-pensionable, have now been declared pensionable. So the pensions have been sweetened by thousands of dollars. An award that's been given that with, without any care whatsoever about what the pension burdens it's, themselves are. So it's not that anyone wants to take away someone's entitlement. It's what has to be done if you are going to be able to have employees that get paid, much less pensioners get paid. There's no question that we need to control a lot of the spigot. It, it, this government is like a, a hose, a garden hose, with so many holes in the hose that nothing comes out the other end. And we're big, building bigger, hoses, bigger holes in that garden hose. And that's, I think, the problem. If, if we don't address that problem, the next generation of employees aren't going to be hired. Many of the pensioners are off in Florida in, in, in enjoying their pensions. There are people here in the city who are going to suffer if this city collapses. Uh, based upon what's going on, it, it may very well happen. I'm an alarmist because I've seen it. I mean, I've been through the fiscal crisis. I was through it and analyzed it, and, I, and, and the mechanisms for bringing it under control were far more powerful than they are today. There is no mechanism to bring it under control. There's no, there's no will of the, of the government. There's no private sector that can do it. There's no control board that can reform it. We are, we are sinking. I mean, I studied these. You know, this is one of my fields. So. Gentlemen, right here. Yeah. So stand up. My name is Sal I think the only thing you can bring, bring more voters uh, to participate in politics is that you use the Scandinavian system. For example, the city council, right, have, uh, let's say, 100 members. And at the minimum amount for you to, to participate in as a political party is that you must have something like 4% of the uh, population who want to vote for you. So it's called apportionment, you know. And uh, as for, for the mayor, 
or other council who want to run independent, they have to do the same also, you know. Must have a uh, people sign a petition for you at least. I mean, the minimum amount of percentage is 4%. Then the third criteria is that you are not allowed, there's a limit on uh, financial uh, advertisement. I mean, as for city council, you only allow the print. Let's say that district has uh, 100,000 people, so you only are allowed to print uh, no more than 300,000 fry. Do you have a question, Mr. You, you, yeah. yeah. All right, so there's a limit. So instead of people based on uh, based on what you call a uh, special interest, they were based on the merit, what they are going to do. Then, I think the poor and the middle class will be willing to participate. Because a lot of this, they, from what I heard from most of the people, they say uh, this, this. Mr. Lim, we need a question from you. You're not supposed to make a speech, you have to ask a question. Yeah, and the problem, what I'm saying is this, you know, the question you address is why why is uh, people are not voting, right? Uh, not participating. That's what I believe because people complain because they are not uh, working for their interests. Let's let someone else ask. I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Because it raises something about sure. the city of New York that I find striking as somebody who's not resident of the city of New York, but who's lived in New York State and various parts of the state all my life. Um, the city of New York is, is you know, as you know, unique in the United States for more reasons than one. It's politically unique. It's a, it is basically a state within a state. It's more French than American in its political design. It has a powerful central government, an extremely powerful executive, and very, and really, uh, no local government. You live in a state with no local government. I would differ with something Joe said about local elections not having high participation rates. In rural and suburban areas of upstate New York and even not far from here, there's pretty high turnout rates in elections. People do feel connected to their local governments. Um, you have very, very low turnout rates in off in elections at odd times, like school board elections, and village elections, which are held in the spring in many places. And in New York City, they, I would simply point out that the city council district in New York City, the typical city council district, holds more people than live in the city of Syracuse, uh, which is New York's fourth or fifth largest city. Uh, so you don't have it, the principle of subsidiarity you know, doesn't exist in the political structure of New York City. There is no local government here. You have the privilege or the, the pleasure of living in two states and paying taxes to both of them. And that is a unique problem in the United States. And, and to tie it back to what my talk was about, the last severe historic fiscal crisis we had was the city's fiscal crisis, which required strong determination led by a governor to do things for and to the city, which was the state within the state over which Albany enjoyed a certain degree of parental rights. The coming fiscal crisis is the state's fiscal crisis. Unfortunately, the state would not face an imminent threat of bankruptcy and a receivership with a uh, federal bankruptcy judge overseeing. And that's the problem that we're facing. It's actually a bigger problem. So that kind of ties the political ends around indirectly, I know, but I, I thought that was an important point to make. Gentlemen, yes, sir. I'm at Wesley, class of 65. Um, it seems to me, summing up what each of you have said, uh, and using Tom's um, forbidden word of leadership, is we have no state leadership. And I think that's the gist of the problem here. Um, in all due respect to whoever sent that email to, to Frank, this governor has no credibility. So whatever he announces tomorrow, nobody's gonna listen to. There's no leadership in the Democrats in the Senate. The only leader that we have is Shirley Silver, and God forbid. So I think it, it is going to be the governor's race or we're down at our knees in September of 2010. Well, I would note that uh, uh, Mr. Lazio has endorsed the Constitutional Convention. 
<laughs> Mr. Le uh, Mr. Les, and and uh, perhaps you know other leaders of that stature, some of whom are in the room, will endorse the Constitution Convention. And uh, if we uh, a start is to get the people running to attend to the opportunity to make change, to to embrace the opportunity to make change as part of their self-interest as they run. By the way, we did have proportional representation in New York in the 1940s, and uh, which was suggested by one of the gentlemen who was speaking that we have a proportional representation election system. It, uh, we had, it, had the, it had the consequence of electing uh, a communist uh, to the city council. How, how is that different? <laughs> well, Fred, your definition and mine are quite different, apparently. But then the declared communist who ran as a communist party candidate Let's put it that way. The chief of staff, the fellow who just elected, controller, the chief of staff is an admirer of North Korea. So we have, we're in a certain sense, we're back to where we were. Okay, you're more informed now. We're, we're, we're running out of time. Let me just get one more question. Does anyone, anyone is, feels an, ur an urgent? Uh, Jeff? Hi, I'm Jeff Kressler. I'm a historian. And uh, if I could get personal for a minute, Looking at the individuals who were in New York State government in the 1970s fiscal crisis, you had individuals like Warren Anderson and, and John Markey in addition to uh, uh, Governor Carey, and I would submit that there's a qualitative difference between the character and capacities of people in state government today than then. And I'm just wondering whether you buy into that or whether you think that it was equally venal then, but they happened to get lucky. <laughs> well, you know, when you Carey was elected, uh, some of us were young professors, when you Carey was elected, he knew nothing about New York State. And his, prin his principal answer in the period between the day he was elected and the day he took office was, uh, ask Professor Shalala, she's helping with that. So all, all substantive uh, questions were referenced to Donna, who made out okay, I guess. So the, uh, so uh, he wasn't well prepared. Uh, the Republicans were in denial. I know that from Malcolm Wilson directly, who lost that election. And uh, uh, we were lucky with Warren Anderson. We got lucky with uh, Stanley Fink, but he wasn't the, the assembly uh, speaker at, at that time. He became speaker later. So we have to, uh, we sometimes get lucky. We sometimes have people of great capacity and, and skill uh, uh, and the democratic, uh, and we have to work with, that's why we need systems that work, because we can't count on people of extraordinary ability to be elected every time. And it, it very, you know, politics is not exactly the most popular business to be in these days. I, uh, after I ran against uh, Elliot Spitzer, uh, and I ended up working with Elliot, he appointed me as the chairman of the commission of, for property tax relief, so I was grateful to him for that. But after that loss, I was offered a lot of jobs to make an awful lot of money. I'm a lawyer and a certified public accountant. I work for Arthur Anderson Company and Chairman Sterling. And I was offered jobs, I'm embarrassed to say how much money I was offered. I was offered jobs as a dean of a law school, I was offered jobs at a Wall Street investment banking firm, and other, it's, and this is a tough business. I mean, it's, it's 8.15 at night. I've got a wife and three children at home. Uh, I've got a middle of a campaign election. I was out. I was out late every night for the past three weeks. So you don't make as much money. You get beaten up on a regular basis. Most people think you're a bum because you're in politics. They look at the word politics. Poly is a Greek word which means some people is a different interpretation. Poly of the many. Ticks of blood sucking insects. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly the most popular profession to be in these days. And. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to try and encourage good people to get involved in politics. And, you know, when you, it, it, sometimes you see people get inspired, they decide to run. They run against an incumbent congressperson or an incumbent assembly person or state senator, and they lose. Because they didn't come up through the chairs and they didn't learn about the business of politics, and they don't understand how it's a sophisticated business. But you have to learn the skill sets that are necessary to participate in it. So, uh, it's a tough business to get in, especially as it's become more difficult. I mean, look at, I mean, nobody can say that Obama is not an incredibly talented person. Incredibly talented, intelligent, able guy that can be doing anything with his life. Look at how he's getting beaten up for trying to change things on, on something that uh, needs to be changed, health insurance. And it's been, it's, and a lot of the attacks are very personal. So this is, you know, we've become very, very gotcha 
know, the, the competition of media, in the media these days, the media is changing so rapidly. And a lot of traditional media had tremendous journalistic integrity that required that you could do certain things and not do certain things. And those standard journalistic uh, institutions are now facing competition from the internet, which has no standards and it has to, you don't live by standards to what you blog or what you create. A lot of the tabloids don't necessarily have any standards as to what they put in the papers as well. So there's been a dumbing down of the process and the conversation as part of it, and it makes it less and less attractive to be in public life. So, uh, so I don't know your answer, I just want to share those yeah. thoughts. <laughs> uh, with those appealing thoughts, let's, let's thank our panelists.